Okay. Hello, my name is Tom Singer, and this is Concert Cues from the Billing Symphony. We're here today with our guest artist for the, the Romeo and Juliet concert on Valentine's weekend. Hedja, I'm not going to get it right. Why don't you give it to us, please? So it's not Romeo and it's not Juliet, but it's Peja Mujia. Very, very simple. Uh-huh, just like Smith, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one. <laughs> Maybe in Sarajevo, but not here. So let's start about your background. I mean, you, you, you started in a very different place than New York City. Uh, yes, but I'm coming to Montana, hopefully, to, to go to Belgrade, which is, of course, part of, from <laughs> named after my... <laughs> of course, we... we, we we also so, have 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 towns like Haver that it's you know Montana's got a lot of weird names in it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was born in Sarajevo, which was at the time when I was born Yugoslavia, and now is Bosnia. And uh, I uh, went to school there, and then I moved to Zagreb to what is now Croatia to continue my education. And I came to the States in 1984 when I was 20 years old and uh, went to Curtis Institute in, in Philadelphia and went to Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore and then the Juilliard School and I stayed in New York. And uh, you, must have, you must have established some uh, credentials to go to the Curtis Institute and some places like that. You, you uh, auditioned for those, uh, those and were accepted. That's, you, you must have been a pretty impressive player by that point. No, I'm sure they were desperate, but I, I did audition, yes. <laughs> 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 well, you managed to build a, a very interesting career. Your biography has a lot of amazing things on it. One of them that, of course, is local interest to us here is Tippett Rise. So what, what's your connection with that organization? So I'm very honored and fortunate to be the artistic advisor to Tippett Rise Art Center. And so Montana is a very, very special place in my heart. I first came to Tippett Rise to play uh, by invitation of Charlie Hamlin, who held this position before me, uh, who sadly passed away. And uh, so it was my first encounter with Peter and Kathy Holstead and, and Tippett Rise. And it's amazing uh, land and amazing hall and just amazing facility. So uh, it's uh, my, my position is, is a bit sad because Charlie Hamlin passed away. But so his aura is around me. He was a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, when he passed away and I, I spoke at a variety, variety of memorials, I always said, if you went to three classical concerts in your life, you were touched by Charlie Hamlin because he, he was one of the major artist agents, but he was responsible for the career of Joshua Bell and Andre Watts and, you know, Lila Josephovitz and Arlie Noget and, you know, Johnny Thibode and many, many other people. And he always said, I look after artists. And that's what he did. So, so he wasn't a performer so much as a manager? He was a manager, yeah. He was a manager, and then he worked for Orchestra of St. Louis in New York and for Tippet Rise, and that's how I hmm. was very fortunate to get to Tippet Rise. And you know, I don't, I don't think any of us forget the first entrance to Tippet Rise. I was, I was kid, <laughs> late in the day, the dirt road, and then there was a. Now I'm going to show my uh, urban creds. Is it herd of sheep? There were many <laughs> sheep <laughs> on the road, and so we had to stop the car. And there was that glorious Alexander Calder sculpture at the prize. And I thought, well, there's nothing like it. <laughs> there, there really is nothing like it. So you, you, uh, you'll be playing there more in the future, we hope, uh, when this COVID thing gets, gets past us? Yeah, I hope we can all go back to that magical spot and meet there together. So yeah, I, I can't wait to spend more time there. So ironically, my last trip before the pandemic was the Tippet Rise where I recorded and something that will eventually come out as a Bach family album of music of Johann Sebastian Bach and his, some of his sons. And I flew back home on March 14th and that was, the, you know, that was my last trip. So it's quite meaningful that my first trip after, well, not quite, but the first big trip after, well, during the pandemic is back to Billings. Yeah, well, and, and we're so glad you're coming. We're so glad you can come with, that we've managed to make, make this work. Um, and uh and all that but the territory is going to look a little different there's some snow on the ground now 
<laughs> there was a lot of snow in March when I left. And, and actually, when, when Anne Harrigan emailed me about this concert, my first, first thing I said to her, I just want to salute you for doing this. And I want to salute you for, you know, doing in whatever little space we are allowed to function in. You know, yeah. safely. So I, I think it's really, really impressive that Billy Zipani is doing this. Well, and so the piece that you're playing, I, is, I assume, works in a in an environment where you've got a smaller orchestra, and and that sort of thing. So let's talk about the piece. What's what's special about it to you? So uh, I'm a huge fan of Mozart piano concertos. I think it's some of his best music, and it's some of my favorite music to, to play. Uh, I don't know exactly why. I could sort of guess that I'm, I'm a big opera lover, so I think the opera is very present in Mozart piano concertos. It's full of gestures and characters. And this particular piece, uh, written very early on, I mean, Mozart life was sadly so short that age 21 is, is mid-career, ironically. And, uh, but he wrote it for uh, a young pianist uh, whose name is, is a bit of a uh, bit of a mystery. She's either called Yenomi or Genomi or Janom or so it's in various languages. And it is reputed that she was the daughter of a French choreographer who were passing through Salzburg. And that Mozart wrote it for her, still at this point trying to kind of position himself as a composer, really looking for employment. I mean, he was looking for patronage and, and work. But what's interesting about this particular uh, concerto is that because it was written for her with the idea, the idea that she would play it, it is uh, quite written out. And what I mean by that is that Mozart was first and foremost the piano virtuoso and he wrote for himself to play. And the way he made living, especially later on when he, after this, when he moved to Vienna, he would organize these, what he called academies, which now we would call concerts. And he would sell subscriptions and then write concertos and sometimes symphonies, hire musicians to play. He would play the piano. And then later on, he would publish these concertos because, of course, by this point, he becomes quite popular. But he was a bit stingy about exactly what he played. So he, uh, his uh, printed music is often a bit of a skeleton of what he would have kind of improvised and ornamented. So this particular work, there's a few other examples, but very few in which we have an actual kind of roadmap of what he would have done or one of many possibilities he would have done. So it's a really interesting piece of information for us. So his concerts, he would just make stuff up, I take it, at times. Well, within, obviously within the themes that he, you know, we, we do have, you know, I would say, 70 or 80 percent of what he would have played but there is certainly 30 or so or maybe 25 percent that he would have added sometimes they're just simple ornaments sometimes they're you know uh, sort of bigger gestures that he would fill out and you know in interesting ways so yeah and probably yeah. differently every time yeah and in in some ways similar to what jazz music musicians do rock musicians i mean the, yeah. very much so i always think how you know 300 years from now if somebody woke up and picked up this the sheet music of beatles yesterday or something in which you just have like the clonk chords <laughs> clonk chord you think that's not what they did <laughs> so this is what sometimes we musicians classical musicians deal with we get this kind of roadmap and you know we have to Sometimes, in some cases, composers did the whole written out thing. Yeah, the whole the whole debate in in pop music about whether covers should be exact or not, and and that just isn't a choice in classical music. You're everybody's bringing something fresh to it. Yeah. So you you have an interesting habit of of um, doing concerts that combine things like Mozart with composers like John Cage, and and I'm curious about that. What is it that's why is it you mix those those kind of performances together? Well, it's, it's a psychological condition that I clearly have. <laughs> 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 so I love juxtapositions in everything, whether it's in food or design or um, music. So so I feel that in in each one of those cases, we as the consumer or customer get to react in a perhaps more fresh way to either side of the equation. So if you put an old 
object, and it doesn't have to be some, you know, multi-million dollar old object, but an old object in a, a lobby of a new building, they establish a dialogue of some sort. Let's say an old piece of furniture in a very sleek, uh, you know, they, you, you react to it subconsciously. If you put some dried fruit in a stool, that also your taste buds react to it. So it's the same in music. I, I find that, that juxtaposing different flavors uh, refreshes my interest in when I go back to, let's say, flavor A after flavor B. And I perhaps hear it with a little different, kind of a palate cleanser in both directions. And then, of course, I also, because I love a lot of different kind of music, that also allows me to kind of get all of my favorites in one, in one bag. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what is, is the, does the Mozart piece tell a story for you? Is there a narrative to it? Is there a narrative to John Cage that's different? Uh, or, or how does, how does that work? How do you feel about that? So I, I do think that music is an, an abstract narrative, an abstract because there is no, there are no words. So the narration is not like, you know, Peter got up and then opened the door, but we do react to sounds. We do react to sounds both horizontally, meaning as they follow each other and vertically, as they happen at the same time. So, um, and I think we, we hone our reaction as we listen to it more and more. So if you listen to a lot of country music, you're much more attuned to subtle differences between different styles or different singers, different songwriters. And it's the same in classical music or rap or whatever kind of music that you react to. Now, unlike songs, we instrumentalists don't have words. So even, we are even more abstract. But honestly, even songs, I mean, I grew up you know, listening to American and English pop music having no idea what they're saying. And still mm -hmm. every so often I hear a song that I, you know, heard in childhood, I think, that's what she's saying? I had no idea. <laughs> I, I have that experience all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it is, I do, um, I, I do think of gestures, I think of colors, I think of uh, whether something is inside or outside, I think whether something is at night or in the morning. I think if it's inside, is there a carpet? Is the floor stone? And I think if you, if you kind of challenge yourself as you listen to any music and you start posing these very simple questions, you realize that you have a lot of reactions. Sometimes it's very simple. Sometimes it's really like, oh, it's night. It has to be night. Or it's raining. It's definitely raining. <laughs> so anyway, I, so I, 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 I do think about it and it, it does evolve as I, you know, live with the piece for this point in my life, decades. It doesn't completely change, but it sort of hones itself in a different way. So it's, it's a fun way to, to listen to music. So when, when did you first meet Mozart's Ninth Concerto? <laughs> Actually, in a somewhat uh, uh, hurried situation, I jumped in for a colleague in Toronto and played two concertos, played this concerto and the Mendelssohn concerto for piano, violin and string orchestra, which I think I learned in all of like a week or something, or I tried to learn in a week. And so it was, <laughs> it was somewhat traumatic, but incredibly joyful. <laughs> ah. and, and so does, does playing it again here bring back a, a positive memory or a little bit of fear or what goes with that? Very much positive. Though it is interesting, it will be the first time I will play in front of people in almost a year. Oh, sure. And you know, I mean, other than, you know, we, we've all got into filming and, uh, you know, I filmed three recital programs in my apartment and then I went to Rockport, Massachusetts to film a program in a hall. So they were audio engineer. And even there, I realized how scared I was when there were people. Because just, I haven't, you know, it's like anything, it's, it's a muscle you exercise of going out on stage, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's gonna be fun. But, you know, I, I look forward to 
hanging out with Mozart. And it, you know, the whole video thing is very interesting because obviously we live in the age of technology and uh, you know, we have archived concerts like a Tippet Rise, the archiving is very, very substantial. In many other halls, it's not for a variety of usually financial reasons. So it's in a funny way, we will leave relatively small footprint of what has happened in live concerts around the world. But now in this last two months, everybody got into video production. And in some ways we have all expanded what we do. Like we certainly have to rise, but you know, we are a summer season. And now we've been producing content throughout the year and actually we're gonna start releasing some of the new videos that we have filmed and we're just plotting to do more of them. So it's been very interesting to kind of ask ourselves, how do we share music and how do, what is the, what is another way? I mean, obviously there's nothing as wonderful as being in the same room together. Yeah. But it was interesting to stretch those parameters. Right. And the, then you get into all the, the weird little legal things. It's easy to do it with public domain works. Uh, John Cage works are, are still copyrighted. So recording those isn't as easy and, I mean, it, yeah. It, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because we're all in uncharted territory, including the idea of, of author's rights, because in, in concert situations, there are uh, established um, kind of regulations, how you pay certain license fee, licensing fee and all that. But now, in a way, we are thrown into like TV and movie business, which, of course, we're not because we're not making mm -hmm you know, hundred million dollar movies. So uh, the publishing companies are also trying to work out like, what does this mean? And how do we value this? And how, what do we charge for it? It's been a really fascinating time for all of us. Yeah. And it ends up on, on YouTube and anybody yeah. can watch it for free. And yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a very confusing environment. Um, tough to navigate. Well, um, we're, we're come close to using up our time. I wonder if you've got any parting thoughts you'd like to share with the audience before they listen to you play. Um, well, I guess the only, the only thing I would like to share or invite the people to the concert and, uh, you know, we, there's a certain stigma about classical music that, that, you know, one has to know a lot in order to appreciate it. And, but I would invite people to just react in their own way. I mean, the beauty of the arts is that there is no, uh, there's no value system in the arts. In other words, it's a very personal thing. You may like Leonardo da Vinci and Billy Bob Smith may think it's terrible. So, and you're both right, because, and, and then you may change your opinion five years from now. And I think that's really why we need the arts, because like food, arts is a place that's really your own. And you can, it's your domain to decide what you like and what you don't like. So I, I hope that people uh, can, you know, who are listening to any music, uh, can allow themselves to react in their own way, to like it or not like it, fully knowing that they can change their opinion later. And... To, to kind of go with the sounds and see what they mean to them, whether they're pleasant or whether they're confrontational or they are friendly, or is it day, is it night, is it raining, is there grass, is there a hill? <laughs> so anyway, or snow, my, yeah. Or <laughs> snow. <laughs> uh, great idea, I couldn't agree more. That's great, well, very well said. Pedro, we're looking very, very much forward to, to uh, hearing you play and seeing you here in Billings. So, I look forward to it much and hope to see you all in the hall. Travel safe. Thank you. Bye-bye now.